1918, Europe was emerging from the Great War bled dry. While the United States was already making a people's car, the Model T Ford, back on the old continent, only the moneyed class could afford this luxury. In Germany, the brands were Opel, Audi, and of course, Benz, Daimler, and Mercedes. They could cost then up to the equivalent of 100,000 euros today, an impossible price to pay for a corporal, one Adolf Hitler. Hitler had been very fond of motor cars since the end of the Great War. But he was poor. He didn't have any money. And he didn't have a job when he arrived in Munich. From 1919 onwards, Hitler began his meteoric political rise that would lead him in less than two years to the head of the Nazi party, the NSDAP, a position that allowed him a certain number of advantages. The Nazi party was financed by Munich's industrial and financial bourgeoisie. And using the funds allocated to it, Hitler could equip the party, rent halls for political meetings, acquire a newspaper as a mouthpiece for the party, and he could also buy a car. This car, paid for by the National Socialist Party in 1920, was a 24-horsepower Selva 620, a make which no longer exists. But very soon, Hitler was to change models after a decisive meeting. There was an element of chance which intervened in that the Nazi party journal was printed in a building in an inner suburb of Munich, in a district called Max Vorstadt, and in this building there was also a Mercedes car showroom. And the head salesman of the Benz showroom, Jakob Verlin, showed him the Benz models. Hitler realized straight away that he should get rid of his Selva. He absolutely must have a Benz. The dealer convinced Hitler. In September 1923, he bought from him his first Mercedes-Benz, the 1030 model, more luxurious, faster, and twice as powerful as the Selva. Then he bought the 1650. He didn't enjoy it for long. It was confiscated two months later, when he was arrested and thrown into prison for an attempted putsch in Bavaria. Then followed nine months of detention, during which he wrote the outline of Mein Kampf. But from his fortress, Hitler also kept up a regular correspondence with his car dealer. He asked whether this or that model in which he was interested could be bought at a reduced price, a discount which Mercedes would offer because, after all, he was an important political personality, and so he asked for a deal, if you like, on the purchase of his car. As he said to his dealer, listen, I'm expecting considerable royalties on my book, but I have to say that a discount of a few thousand marks would help me buy the car for myself. Jacob Verlin, the car dealer, was to become a confidant of the future dictator. He supplied his Mercedes-Benz cars right up to his fall from power, models which became bigger and bigger as he rose in influence. The Model 1140, which he bought on leaving prison, then the 1570, with 70 horsepower less than a year afterwards. In this luxurious car, he covered over 370,000 miles across Germany. But Hitler's name soon became associated with one model, which he abandoned only rarely until his death, the Mercedes 770. In Germany, in Sinsheim, near Stuttgart, the Automobile and Technical Museum is one of the largest private museums in Europe. Among the thousands of rare cars, the dictator's last Mercedes are preserved in perfect condition. All were based on the design of the Mercedes 770, launched by the maker in 1930. In all, 205 models were built up until 1943. This car is a Mercedes 770K. It's a ceremonial car used by the Reich in 1938. As you can see, it's a convertible, very rare. The Model K, which is armored, was produced from 1938 onwards. There are only 12 left in the world. The population called it Große Mercedes, the Grand Mercedes. It was at that time the biggest and most expensive car, so expensive that its price didn't appear in the catalog. A monster of a car like its owner. Monstrous in its size, six meters long, two meters 20 wide, and one meter 70 high and in its weight as well, 4.8 tons unladen. Its huge gasoline tank had a capacity of 300 liters for a range of only 500 kilometers, 
Grand Mercedes used 60 liters of gasoline for a distance of 100 kilometers. Adolf Hitler's automobile was then the heaviest in the world, due to the model's imposing size for the time, but also because the dictator, from 1939 onwards, only traveled in armored cars. And again, it was Mercedes, the pioneer in the subject, that took it on. The Stuttgart firm built an entirely armored version of the 770. The whole of the bodywork was in 18 millimeter steel. The body floor was reinforced with an 11 millimeter steel plate designed to withstand the explosion of 500 grams of dynamite. The 12 centimeter thick doors weighed 150 kilos each, equivalent to the weight of eight normal doors. The windows, made of superimposed sheets of glass, were 4.5 centimeters thick and also bulletproof. The crazy thing about this car was that it was armored. Even at the floor level, it was mineproof. But the statesman wasn't protected above the waist, because it was a convertible. It doesn't make sense. Hitler was convinced he was aided, abetted, and watched over by a lucky star. If he could drive in state for hours unprotected without getting shot, it was obvious that he was the chosen one. Not only by the German people, but also by history, by which he meant a higher being, which he called fate. Fate or fear? None of the dozens of assassination attempts were aimed at the Nazi leader while he was in his cars. With this convertible model, Hitler created part of his personality cult. It was his pedestal on which he would always show himself off. Remember that Hitler was fascinated by ancient Rome. He was an autodidact who read an enormous amount on the history of antiquity and particularly on the history of ancient Rome. And of course, he knew the ritual of triumph. Charmed by this image of the imperial Caesar, poised upright on his chariot, with his slave behind him holding the laurel wreath over his chief's head, Hitler wanted to imitate this Roman symbol. Dictators need symbols to represent their power. In the old days, kings sat on thrones, and for Hitler, it was his car. For this car to become the perfect propaganda tool, Mercedes made a small adaptation, which changed everything. You can raise this seat. Then you can see the step on which Hitler could show his power and his strength. This step gives you an extra 13 centimeters. With this step, the dictator, who was 1 meter 73 tall, could stand up to 2 meters 40 high and look down on the crowds. But although he used the convertibles for ceremonial occasions, he used closed limousines for making long journeys, a million and a half kilometers in 20 years. His last limousine was this model. It's an armored 770K. The same model as the ceremonial Mercedes, but with a roof. This Mercedes in the Automobile and Technical Museum of Sinsheim was built in 1943. It's a car with reinforced armor. You can see by the doors. Only 19 of this model of closed armored limousines were made. And its size is just as imposing as the one used for ceremonial occasions. It measures 6 meters long by 2 meters 50 wide by 1.8 meters high. And it weighs 5 tons. There's also a small refinement. Here, the driver can unlock a mechanism which closes completely the rear window. The driver can operate it to protect the passengers. This steel mechanism can protect passengers' necks against bullets. And finally, to prevent any attack, the maker also provided puncture-proof tires. They are rubber, but with a honeycomb design based on 20 independent chambers. If one or two explode, the tire retains its effectiveness. But the weight is a drawback. Each wheel weighs about 100 kilos, five times more than a normal wheel. 
dass die sich damals And the spare wheel is so heavy that at that time they invented a system to assist a wheel change. You unscrew here, that's the lock. And then one man can take out this wheel, weighing more than 100 kilograms. Supported by the strength of the spring, you can take it out like this and put it down into the position required in order to change the wheel. To power this five-ton monster, Mercedes called in help for the engine from one Ferdinand Porsche, a brilliant engineer, self-taught, mad about car racing. He trained with Benz, then with Mercedes, before creating his own make. For the 770 model, Porsche introduced a motor based on racing car technology. The engine has eight 7.7-liter cylinders in line. It develops the exceptional power of 400 horsepower as much as a racing car. At that time, standard cars like the Citroën Traction in France did no better than 32 horsepower. Ferdinand Porsche added a further refinement, characteristic to V8 engines, double ignition, 16 spark plugs, two to each cylinder. This technology, very uncommon at the time, allows both an increase in the engine output and guarantees its reliability. If one spark plug is faulty, the other one takes over. The dictator's car must not break down. The innovation in the manufacture of the engine was in both the high quality of the assembly, rare for the time, practically Swiss watch precision, combined with a quality of metal alloy hardly used at the time apart from in competition cars, and which allowed high output without the usual problems of wear or heat or of early overheating. To get up to 400 horsepower, eight cylinders were not enough. So the engineers at Mercedes added a compressor, which up to that time had only been used in aeronautics or competition cars. Here on the right side of the motor, we have the carburetor of this big Mercedes engine, linked directly to the large compressor here. Its compressor technology was thought of by the Frenchman Louis Renault. The principle is simple. Air taken from outside is compressed in this part of the engine, then injected into the cylinders. The compressed air multiplies tenfold the energy on explosion. That is how an engine of 250 horsepower can reach 400 horsepower. Seventy-four years after it came out of the factory, Adolf Hitler's Mercedes 770K is still running. With its outsized consumption of 60 liters per 100 kilometers, it can reach a speed of 180 kilometers an hour, thanks to its compressor, which is mechanically activated. To activate the compressor, you use a pedal with two levels. You depress the pedal until you feel a slight resistance. And if you press against this resistance, the compressor is activated. Adolf Hitler, who was fascinated by mechanical innovations, spent a lot of time at car shows. It was he, too, who dreamed up the large-scale manufacture of a people's car, the Volkswagen, which first came off the production line three years after the end of the Reich. But for all this, the dictator never drove his own vehicles. Hitler didn't have a driver's license, and that's quite interesting, because in German, the name for a driver's license is Das Führerschein. Even today, Das Führerschein translates literally as driver attestation, and the driver, de Führer, is also the chief, de Führer. So you see here, we have a Führer who doesn't have Führerschein. You see? When the Reich fell, part of Hitler's automobile pool was seized at his residence in Berchtesgaden by General Leclerc's armored 2nd Division. Among the spoils of war was the famous Mercedes 770K. General Leclerc offered the ceremonial model to his comrade-at-arms, General de Gaulle. 